For years, Susan Middleton photographed objects. I took pictures of rare artifacts in museums. None of it was alive. But then I began to want to show living things. There, that's beautiful. Great. At the same time, David Litschwager <laughs> worked as a commercial photographer. Smile with your eyes. It was, you know, a glamorous life, a New York City fashion photographer. But I always wanted to make pictures that the world had a use for. Uh, chin up just a little bit. Chin up. Chin up. One day in 1986, Susan and David took a photograph of an endangered creature. It was the beginning of an obsession. Excuse me? Ever since, the two photographers have taken portraits of animals and plants on the brink of extinction. These creatures are known as statistics by most people, but we're treating them as individuals, trying to capture their personalities. We want to see them face to face, eye to eye, make them unavoidable. <gasps> the series is now their mission in life, their calling and their passion. We fall in love with these creatures. What we're trying to show is some of that wonder that we experience. That's pretty funny. Come on, down here. David and Susan's portraits have gazed at us from books, magazine covers, museum exhibits. But does the popularity of their work mean that these creatures will survive? For the two photographers, it's an endless odyssey across America to show the faces of creatures we may never see again. These creatures are in danger. They're slipping away. But if people can see them, maybe we can make the effort to keep them with us here on Earth. Okay, be care. Great, great. The first Europeans on this continent had a common enemy to conquer. It was called nature. America seemed to be an endless expanse of hostile wilderness. Bison wandered along the Potomac. Grizzly bears strolled the beaches of California. Human beings did not even know it was possible for a species to go extinct. But we learned. Hundreds of creatures slipped into extinction. Even our national symbol was disappearing before our eyes. But then America did something no other country had ever done. In 1973, we passed a law to save our wild creatures. The Endangered Species Act protects the lives and habitats of plants and animals in immediate danger of extinction. Today, there are over a thousand species on the list. David and Susan's quest to photograph the endangered species of America has taken them over hundreds of thousands of miles through all 50 states and every conceivable American landscape. We drive because we have thousands of pounds of equipment to take with us. And we can't plan too far ahead because we have to adapt ourselves to nature's timing. So we have to be in Texas when a plant blossoms, or in California when a butterfly emerges from its chrysalis. And that means we drive. This time, they're driving toward Laramie, Wyoming, and the prairies of the West. Mm -hmm. 
Once the Great Plains were a song about freedom. The buffalo roamed. Prairie dogs ranged everywhere. But they had a dangerous habit. They ate grass. And so did a new animal on the prairie. So cattle ranchers went to war. In the end, the ranchers won. But it was another creature that suffered most. The black-footed ferret has a monotonous diet, prairie dogs, and little else. It was an accident. People weren't trying to harm the ferret. But when you kill off one creature, you turn around and something else is gone. The ferret disappeared from the prairie. We thought it was extinct until a tiny group suddenly turned up. In 1987, all the black-footed ferrets in the world, just 18 animals, were brought to live in a single building. Most biologists thought the animal was doomed. Ferrets are highly susceptible to infectious diseases. Everything that goes in that possibly will come in contact with an animal or even in close proximity to the animal's cages has to be wiped down. Um, so we could get you showered through and uh, then take a look at the equipment. We've never been in a situation where an animal was so tightly quarantined. And of course, that's why we had to go through the showering process and putting on the scrubs. And then all of our equipment had to be sterilized before we went in. It feels like we're in some kind of intensive care unit devoted only to ferrets. We'll just need to rinse the bottoms of our shoes with a okay. viricide. OK, yeah, we can get you guys some surgical masks. Where anytime you're in contact or in a room that has a black-footed ferret in it, you can just close that first set of doors there. It's not unlike the way you feel when you go into a hospital and see a loved one all hooked up to life support system. This is a young of the year. Their very survival is so precarious, hanging on by a thread. She's pretty inquisitive. If it weren't for a very rigorous captive breeding program, there would no longer be any black-footed ferrets in the world. You know, it's a ferret factory. The point is production. Make more ferrets. This is the perfect time during the breeding season because we have almost every possible thing going on. We have animals that have just been paired. There's the male grabbing the female into oh, the breeding yeah. box. Oh, if she's not interested, she'll fight back. They'll start hissing and chattering. What does that sound like? Yeah, it sounds like a <laughs> Then we know, like, the they're buttons. fighting and stuff, yeah. So it feels kind of voyeuristic. Yeah, it's a little <laughs> voyeuristic. In the past 10 years, over 1,000 ferrets have been born here. Ooh. You'd think that an animal that slept for 20 hours a day might be easy to photograph. They never stop moving. You really need everything to be just right for about two minutes. But two minutes is a long time to ask a ferret to stand still. Whoa. So there's no such thing as like calming down after a while. No. Yeah. Oh. Ah. Ah. He's OK. Can you just take it on the floor? <laughs> Do you want to try another older animal? Yeah, we'll let's try Gypsy. <laughs> let's try Gypsy. Come on out, Gypsy. Oh, beautiful. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. When she has her head up like that, I think that's her best look. In 1991, the first captive bred ferret was released. The black-footed ferret was a wild animal again. But many of the released ferrets have died, and there is no way of knowing whether the animals born in the factory for ferrets will ultimately die out or live on to play in the freedom of the wild.
When you're driving across America, you understand why so many plants and animals are endangered. They're losing their homes. We're building a human world and losing the wild one. From Wyoming, the road goes east to Cambridge, Massachusetts. But they're not going to find an endangered creature. They're meeting one of the greatest experts on why species go extinct, distinguished scientist Edward O. Wilson. It's a sobering fact there is an extinction crisis. There have always been species going extinct from time to time, but now human activity has pushed it up a hundred to a thousand times. We're in the midst of a biological catastrophe that's the greatest since the end of the age of dinosaurs, 65 million years ago. What I hope you'll succeed in doing is to make endangered species a vivid presence in the lives of people. Make it clear to them that every endangered species has a name, it has a million year history, it has a place in the world. Bring us face to face with each one of those species. Make us know that they're our companions in the biosphere. They're not just something out there you look at once in a while, but they're part of our existence. They're part of us. Fifty million years ago, an animal related to the elephant crawled back into the sea. It was huge and gentle. It had no enemies, so it had no fear. Now, after eons of tranquility, the manatees of Florida should fear one creature. Every year, speedboats kill scores of manatees. Over 90% of all manatees bear scars from propellers. What we're looking at right here is actually a, a huge wound from a propeller that just gashed the whole side of Cinco here. Biologist Ed Gerstein is working to find out why the collisions happen. And after they've been hit once or twice or three times, why don't they learn to get out of the way? Yeah. The subjects of Ed's research are two captive-born manatees, Stormy and Dundee. The common perception was that these animals are dumb and they're slow. But actually, we've proven that the animals are very intelligent. Hand signal given. OK, this is run number six, gallon in series 99. Ed's co-worker is his wife, Laura. Run number six is a tone at negative 30. Each animal has an individual personality. And with Stormy, he's so crafty. He just is interested in entertaining himself. And then when he decides to work, he'll work when he's ready. Stormy has been trained to leave the hoop after he sees the strobe light and go make a selection. If he doesn't hear a sound, he'll go over and push the solid white paddle. And if he hears it, he'll push the stripe paddle. Touch. That's correct. These animals have very good high-frequency hearing. The problem is, boats put out low frequencies. So we hope from our research to come up with a device to put on a boat to make boats audible to manatees so that they get out of the way. Stormy and Dundee, quiet in their quiet world, just do what they've always done, graze peacefully and almost constantly. They eat 30 or I forget how many heads of romaine lettuce a day. And how can these animals get so big like that, eating a completely fat-free diet, lettuce? I mean, I can't imagine it. Stormy likes to play tricks. If he were a human, he'd be a juvenile delinquent. There's no feeling quite like being gummed by a manatee. Here we go. Great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whoa! A little too close. 
they're very curious animals. And whenever anything enters the water, they come over to inspect. Stormy, come back. Oh, beautiful. There's so much feeling behind what they do. You can just see it and the playfulness that they have. Oh, no. <laughs> Way too close. Ah! <laughs> The more you're around them, it's almost like you can hear them think. <laughs> Somebody get it. <laughs> you can get it. Looks like a big smile. Go for it. All told, 415 manatees died in 1996. Today, some 2,400 remain. When you look at the world, you know, the manatee's just a speck. It's just one other thing that's going, and so many things are going. And the, the beauty of a manatee, you know, it'll be a shame. Three thousand miles later, they're going to the Sacramento River Delta to photograph an endangered insect. But the Delta green ground beetle is almost invisible. Four times before, we've gone out looking for this beetle, never finding this thing. They have big eyes. They're sensitive to movement, they're day active, so this is the time they would be active. Well, this time we are meeting five of the leading experts and uh, it's like bringing in the big guns. The best way to spot them is to sit in one place and become very quiet and then just gaze. You look straight at it, you can't see it. It's like it blends in so perfectly. I could see if David and I weren't able to find it, but when you go out with experts and they can't find it, then you begin to wonder. Eureka. Wow. You see it? It's at 4 o'clock from the plant. Yeah. Even when she was pointing it out, I still couldn't see it. Now you know it's real. <laughs> <laughs> Fifth try is a charm. Uh, toward its legs. Yep. Every color of the rainbow is in this beetle, but you have to have a microscope to see it. And you stop and ask yourself, why did nature do that? It's very easy to dismiss the bugs and the weeds of the world, but science is revealing every year just how important are these little things on which we and other larger organisms depend. They cleanse the water. They create the soil. They generate the very air we breathe. Ten thousand years ago, the last glacier raked over the mountains of California. When it receded, it left one kind of gold and splendid isolation high in the Sierras. For over 30 years, this gold has been the object of one man's dreams. David and Susan are headed for the Little Kern River Valley, the only place on Earth where the gold can be found. Dan Christensen here. Pleased to meet you. Dan Christensen is the man who saved a species. It was 1949. I was still in high school. My brother and I would go up to the mountains and go fishing. It was an incredible experience. We just fell in love with the place and with those beautiful fish, the golden trout of the High Sierra. Fifteen years later, I started working for the Department of Fish and Game, and I came across old reports buried in the files. 
They said the golden trout of the Little Kern River might be extinct. So I had to go out and find them, if there were any left alive. Fishermen caused the problem. They introduced other species of trout to improve the fishing. Golden trout were soon overwhelmed by the aggressive newcomers. It was only a matter of five or six years before the golden trout were gone. Mm -hmm. They just wiped them out. So what did it actually feel like when you <laughs> discovered a little Kern golden trout still well, alive? It, it felt like finding gold. <laughs> actually, exciting. yeah, it was very exciting. Dan spent many years removing all the non-native fish from the streams. Only then could he restore the golden trout to their ancient habitat. Well, we're almost to the creek, so you want to be looking for a spot that you can work. We'll go ahead and start collecting while you guys set up. And then we'll set up. set up our aquarium. Great. David has to build an aquarium. It has to be custom built. We have to worry about reflections. We have to worry about bubbles. We have to worry about keeping the fish happy. So it's really a kind of stage. To find trout, Dan goes electrofishing. Any fish in the area will be stunned by electricity. There we go. Oh, there he is. There he is. There he is. Here he comes. Oh, got him. There you go. <laughs> okay. Ready for fish, huh? Yeah. I guess I can just put this down in there. Okay. Perfect. It looks really nice. Okay, stir them up. And then I'll get out of your way. For me, the thrill of seeing these golden trout has never faded. Come on now. Come on, guys. These fish are special. This is the only place in the world that they exist. Dan's labors have brought success. The Little Kern Golden Trout is about to be taken off the endangered species list. I'm happy I could bring these fish back, back to their past in the Little Kern River. And they brought my past back to me. Okay, here we go. Brand new home, all to yourselves. The Golden Trout is going to be with us. There you go, fella. Maybe some high school kid will go up there to the Sierras and find these beautiful golden fish. And he'll never forget it for the rest of his life. Ah, oh, road burn. You know, it's motels. Least expensive motel we can find. Sometimes I just get really tired and want to go home. It's a grind. And you never know what the good restaurant is. Special today is chili. But uh, I've done a lot of other things to make a living, and this is worth continuing. I want to stop. Yeah, but we're not going to get there on time. I know, but why drive all night long? What is the situation from Flagstaff North to you? Dave, ask him about the weather, if it's safe to get there. Uh, here. he's not gonna know that. Yes, he is. What, uh, we're already, let me get to find out from here. This is a big country. And, it, you know, some days you don't notice that it's beautiful. You just get to the next place. The next place is coastal North Carolina. In those days, we had never heard of passing up a chance to kill a wolf. In a second, we were pumping lead into the pack. The old wolf was down. We reached the wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. Aldo Leopold. The fire nearly died. Only 17 true red wolves 
stood between the species and extinction. But then, it was the first animal we attempted to save with a recovery program. Jennifer Gilbreth has worked with red wolves at the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge for six years. We don't really see the wolves all that terribly often, but we know where most of the wolves are because of their radio collars. We can learn a lot by tracking the wolves. And as long as the wolves have a place to live and are left alone, they can do fine. When landowners allow it, wolves are often released onto private property. But wolves don't know about boundaries, where they're supposed to be and where they're not. It's just as much, if not more, about people than it is about wolves. The wolf was actually stalking our, our rams that were out in this pasture because we keep the ewes tied up in the building. A neighbor took a shot at him and he was moving on down the field right that, at that time. But Whoa. he was thinking about lamb chops this morning. That's what he was thinking of. This would be a good little appetizer for him. It really would. And we've got nine of these on the ground right now and I don't want them being hurt. Most people feel very strongly about the creature. A lot of people don't pay any attention really to the facts. Well, I heard that you'd seen some wolves in the area. Yeah, see them, hear tell of them. And uh, so far they're not bothering me, but they get off of their land and they come on my land and they start damaging my property. Then I ain't got my one resort. Now you know what that is. That's we right. spoke about that earlier. I don't like them. I ain't never liked them. I ain't gonna lie about it. The wolf embodies the concept of wild nature. All of us grew up with stories like Little Red Riding Hood and Three Little Pigs. And it goes back into literally ancient times when wolves represented Satan or the devil. So because of the myths, some people are afraid The wolf is more frightened than I am, which is not what I expected at all. And you can feel their fear. I'm just gonna roll it out. Two frames left. Yeah. Is there a chance that the wolf could freak out and attack us? We've never had that happen. We have never had it happen. The big bad wolf is terrified, cowering in the corner. Gotta go, go, go. For the wolves, the news has been good. They've survived. They've bred in the wild and reared young two or three generations. It's very near the breeding season, so we hope that they'll stay together and form a pair bond and do the, thing. Do the right thing. Ready? You wonder, why are we doing this? Why make problems for ourselves by putting wolves back in the world? The answer is that we don't want our world to be just malls with trees and neat little rows. We want wildness out there because it puts the wonder of the world in you. We're going to be late to meet I, these guys. You know, I think we must have passed there or something. It's not it's uh, fitting with what they were describing at all. Excuse me, can you tell me which way it is to the Natchez Trace? Go back to the end of this road to the four-way stop, turn left, it'll be about seven miles. There's a three-way stop on your right. You get the, they call it the yellow store, but it's not yellow anymore. It used to be real yellow years ago, but it's gray now, I think. Can you make a left? 
No, you make a right. Through the stoplight. Uh-huh. And take your first left. But we want to be right and there. And we turned off here and we missed it. Well, maybe you took the wrong the wrong left. If you took the first left the first time, try the second left this time. Just Sadie. turn it at the yellow store. If you don't see a store that's yellow, just turn left at the fat woman. You'll find it. It won't be any problem. Eventually, Susan and David reach Central Florida. And 5,000 acres of deep sand and scrub called Archbold Biological Station. It doesn't look like much at first because the predominant plant is the kind of shrubby looking oak. But it was a, a kind of magic garden that we had no idea we were entering. We've never been in a place that had so many endangered species. All these unique creatures tangled together in a web of life. <laughs> Eastern indigo snake. Florida mouse. Tequesta grasshopper. Scrub mint. Blue-tailed mole skink. Florida scrub jay. Gopher tortoise. Somebody tell me where to stop. But of all the unusual creatures in the scrub, Tom. David and Susan soon discover one of the most intriguing. <laughs> Two takes, 20,000. <laughs> Third take, 30,000. <laughs> when off his bike, Tom Eisner is a distinguished scientist, the pioneer of a technique he calls chemical prospecting. He searches for chemicals in wild plants and animals. He's found nerve drugs in millipedes, insect repellents in a tiny mint plant, compounds for the human heart in fireflies. There's hidden value to nature. Nearly half the medicines that we take are derived from nature. The chemicals that are used by plants, animals, and microorganisms for their own survival. This is unbelievably important. To lose that information is as if we were burning every book on our library shelves. What you want to be alert to is shining things in the dark. Often, Tom finds chemicals in nature by using the life and death of animals as his tool. Right there, that's at about 20 feet. Mm -hmm. There's a tiny little spider there, which I could spot just from the eye shine. And there it is. It's hungry. And I'm going to feed it. A moss. Okay, typical strike. And rejection. You notice she backed away. I mean, you can literally enlist the help of these spiders in helping you do research. You can ask these spiders a simple question. What do you like? What don't you like? Now let's see if she's ready to take something edible. Wow. It eats some, it rejects others. And the question is, why does it reject some? And the answer is because of the defensive chemicals in those items that are rejected. It's chemicals that protect an insect. It could be chemicals that have medical uses. So the spider becomes your partner. And it does this free of charge. Tom, I'm just completely amazed at what we've seen here. I mean, David and I have just been traveling around photographing endangered species isolated from each other, and here is the first place where we've been in a habitat that's still intact. Well, in nature itself, everything is connected. Every species is in some way dependent on others. So you have this fabric of life, and to me, an endangered species is like a critical stitch in that fabric. The longer you study any one area, the more you realize that if any one item becomes extinct, the whole fabric falls apart. Everything depends on everything else. Sixty years earlier, 
Another scientist went in search of an endangered species, deep into the Louisiana swamps, trying to find one of the rarest birds in America. He found it, and he filmed it. It was the first time anyone had ever filmed the ivory-billed woodpecker, and the last. The ivory build has always had a special mystique. You hear rumors that it's still alive, that it's been heard in some deep, dark part of the swamp. We're finally getting to photograph the ivory billed woodpecker, but it's not the way we had hoped. The bird's habitat was decimated by development. In 1996, the ivory billed woodpecker was finally declared extinct. It was rare, and then it slipped away. The preserved specimen is all that's left. Species do not die of old age. Species are killed off. And when a species dies, with it dies this genetic history that can never be recreated. Scientists haven't even begun to think of how they might be able to reassemble a species. And the loss is permanent. There's only one place in the wild where a certain endangered species can live. A windy, foggy microclimate in the middle of San Francisco. There's endangered species in our backyard. And just a few blocks from where we work is this plant, the Presidio manzanita. The manzanita is so rare that its exact location has to be kept a secret for its own protection. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Hi. I'm David. Mark. Biologist Mark Albert will take them to the plant's hiding place. Because it is the last wild individual of this species, it's very, very important that we use extreme caution when we're walking around the plant. So I'd like to ask you if you could very carefully watch where I walk and even how I walk, just so that we're not disturbing anything that shouldn't be disturbed. Now follow my footsteps very carefully here. So you want to walk right along the edge of this plant here. The pressure of our feet and our equipment really endangers the actual plant itself. So there's some rocks here that we should step on when we're near the plant because there are no roots is growing this under. Is okay? Yep. I mean, is this like the only place we can stand? Uh, for any length of time, yes. There it is right there. So this whole green expanse that we're seeing is it. This is it. Oh my God. This is the only wild individual that we know exists at this point. I'd like to get up and really look at it. Can I just walk in or? If you have to step off the rock a little bit, just don't, you know, try to keep your foot planted in one spot. I mean, it's just not, you know, initially that spectacular. It looks like ground cover. It just doesn't look like anything you could make a photograph of that anyone would want to look at. I don't know how we're going to pull this off. Be careful with your left hand, David, on the foliage. But we're not choosing our subjects based on what they look like. We're choosing them because they're threatened with extinction. Do you think we could do just one leaf? Sure. In That's the small cool. scale, it's actually really extraordinary. All living things are amazingly complex and beautiful if you can figure out a way to reveal it. This plant can't reproduce by itself, but it's the last one left in the wild. So the manzanita is what some call the living dead. Plants get ignored 
Almost two-thirds of the species on the endangered list are plants. They're not big and flashy like the giant panda or the rhino, but they're equally as important in how life works. Without plants, the animals wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here. Americans are increasingly absorbed with the artificial, the plastic, with the world of virtual reality. But we're going to come to realize that a real eagle and the rest of nature are vastly more interesting and satisfying than the artificial replicas. That there is a sense of the touch and smell and sight hearing and experience in the real world of nature it can never be duplicated. As nature slips away, we will have created a world in which we will be deprived and lonely. Arthur Bonner is from South Central Los Angeles. We don't have trees. We don't have flowers. We don't have insects, butterflies, spiders. The only thing we have growing is buildings. What did thrive in South Central was gangs. It was full of violence. We would beat people with bats, hit them in the head with bottles. When he was 18, Arthur shot a man in the face. He spent over seven years in juvenile detention in jail. Good morning. Good morning sir. My name is uh, Arthur, and uh, you guys are out here to help us out to save an endangered species. It's called a palace bird. When Arthur got out of jail, he joined the L.A. Conservation Corps. His life was soon turned around by a tiny six-legged companion called the Palos Verdes Blue Butterfly. It's only a little small 300 acres left for these butterflies. Go ahead. So we all need to help maintain it. Nature deserves to be everywhere. It's a caterpillar. I won't bite you, it won't even harm you. You can hold it with your bare hand. It won't do anything to you. So it turn into a butterfly? A moth. Oh, a moth. Yeah. When they come out here and they see the stuff that they find, the insects, the butterflies, the lizards, you know, all of it. It's something that they put in their head and they take it back to the city and they tell their friends, well, ho, we was at a habitat today. <laughs> take him off gently. Arthur is one of just three people who are permitted to gather the butterflies. I'm very dedicated to coming down here. I love to do what I'm doing. I love my work. He uses all his powers of persuasion to help his captives reproduce. Okay, girls, which one of you laid some eggs for me today? The uh, five females that's actually collected out the wild. You know, I bring them in, I have to watch them lay their eggs. There you go, you gave me one. The yeah. butterfly only has a five day lifespan, and it's up to me to keep her baby alive. You're not hungry right now, huh? They don't have to go up and get their food. They have somebody to bring it to them. I bring it to them. You know, they get their food in bed. You know, everybody loves to get breakfast in bed. Because he want to eat it. That's OK. You'll eat it before the day is over with. Like all creatures, the butterfly needs a place to live. If its habitat goes, it goes. The Palos Verdes Blue Butterfly has a precarious home, a postage stamp habitat surrounded by oil refineries. So that's the one that you think is probably And this gonna is gonna be go the first. one that's gonna actually hatch due to the fact that it has a, a better wing formation than any of the uh, other pupae that you actually see on the um, format here. It's been an egg, it's been a caterpillar, and it's been a pupa for a whole year. And it emerges in this one-inch 
butterfly, this bright jewel comes out of a little tiny brown package. comes out, it exists in the world as a butterfly for five days, it finds another of its kind. They mate, the female lays the eggs, and the whole process starts over again. Now, do you think she's going to open her yeah, wings soon? Like that. Yes, she will. Okay. She's going to open them up. Whoop, look yeah, at that. Yeah, see, the wings are dry now. Whoa. The wings are actually dry look now. Look at that. It's taking a little walk. If you've been in pupation for over a year, it's going to take a little time for you to actually um, get out and Fly away. Oh, there, there we go. go. There, there we, we go. go. Now, see what it is. She knows everybody's watching. For 10 years, the Palace Verde's blue butterfly was thought to be extinct. It is still considered one of the rarest butterflies in the world. Come here. Come here. Those are my girls. I love them all. They actually kept me from being extinct as, as much as I'm um, saving them from being extinct. They're saving me, and I'm saving them. Less than 30 miles away from Arthur's quiet butterflies, a more prominent airborne creature is at risk. Catalina Island, just west of Los Angeles, is home to 12 bald eagles. But the eagles have an unseen enemy, DDT. The pesticide, long outlawed, still lingers in the surrounding water, drastically weakening the eagle's eggs. Dave Garcelon has come to Catalina to fool eagles. The eggs in his box are dummies. Dave's mission is to switch the contaminated eggs with the fake ones. Human beings are now the indispensable caretakers for our national symbol, the creature that is supposed to stand for strength and independence. The egg's new home is the San Francisco Zoo, where John Aiken runs the Avian Conservation Center. These eggs that come from Catalina Island are in bad shape. We've got to help them every step of the way. We check them for cracks and repair those, and then put them in very humid incubators. Unfortunately, most of the eggs die. Look at you, you are actually gonna make it out of that. Look at this. Come on, I gotta get you out of there. This is the first egg in five years from Catalina that's hatched. Yes, look at that, you are a healthy little chick. Twelve days later, the eaglet is on her way home. In a few hours, she'll be placed in her nest again. The question is, will her parents accept her or leave her to die? I'm really happy we've gotten this far. The eaglet's odds were not good. She was a contaminated egg. She definitely would have died if we'd left her in the nest. But she survived, and she seems like a survivor. And we just hope she's going to make it from here. Looking great. Is that your mark? Oh, very nice. Beautiful. Oh, Wonderful. That's oh, that's ideal. <laughs> we don't know if this is the beginning or the end for this little eaglet. We don't know if her parents will come and feed her and take care of her. Makeup. <laughs> hey, you. It's tough to, to watch them go. I don't know, it's like sending your kids away to college or something. 
People ask, why do you take your precious babies back to a contaminated environment? The answer to me is simple. The eagles belong here, and maybe in 20 years they'll be able to breed without us. But for now, they can't do it unless we help them. We've led to the decline and extinction of a lot of species, and now we know better. We're the only ones that can make a difference because all these animals and plants can't do it on their own. The biologists end the last leg of the human part of the effort. Now, it's up to the eagles. Seeing that little eagle on that giant cliff face seems so fragile. And our hope is that this eagle and all endangered species, that they survive and we carry them with us into the future. An hour after the climbers have left, the mother accepts the chick. It's really a symbol of hope to see this little eaglet put back into the nest and the parents coming back to nurture it. It's a gesture of hope for not only the eagle, but for the human species too. Human beings are the masters of this world now. We can take these animals and plants with us as we travel into the future, or we can say goodbye and send them into the night. But whether we realize it or not, we depend utterly on other creatures for our very survival. They are part of our existence. They are part of us. <laughs>